congregation. We are a young congregation and there's all kinds of ideas that come up that, that would restrict us and when we get to that point then we get into a survival me mentality and then we just sort of hold our own because we have this deficit. We have this vulnerability. What about the supposed vulnerability of being an older congregation? You know when I came here Almost six years ago, it doesn't seem possible, but next February will be uh, six years. Uh, you just had a, a man, I think his name was Mark Davis. Is that right, Ken? Mark Davis had come and, and he did an analysis of the congregation and he talked about some th the good things about it and, and some of the things that needed improvement. But one of the things that he determined in there that we uh, at Mandarin were an older congregation. And so there's an, a tendency to apologize for that. Whatever vulnerability we see ourselves, we tend to apologize for it and use it as an excuse for not doing something different. But, but why is there necessarily something wrong with being an older congregation? Why is there something wrong with being a younger congregation? Why is there something right about being a younger congregation as opposed to an older, older congregation. Aren't there blessings of plenty when you take the people of a, of a congregation that has defined themselves as older who cannot take, uh, they, they've experienced all of life processes, why can't they love and express to those who are newer, earlier in life processes about what's entailed in the Christian life? Well, of course, there's blessings of plenty there. And that's sort of what has happened. And, and the way I see our congregation now, we have metamorphosized into a balanced congregation because I think this has taken place. And the thing is that we have taken a vulnerability and said, let's make it a strength. And when we make our vulnerability, uh, vulnerability a strength, then we can be what God wants us to be and what we want to be. Now, in the face of these people who define themselves by what's wrong, of course, there's the cynical people. And uh, the cynical people who, who hear about this all the time. After a while, when individuals or, or corporate bodies continually announce what's wrong with them, then people get tired of it, don't they? They don't want to hear it anymore. Have, have you ever heard about somebody's gallbladder? And, you know, a gallbladder that they have taken no precautions about, a gallbladder for which they have refused treatment for, and yet you've heard it 15 times. Aren't you tired of that? Yeah. And so uh, the tendency then, uh, if that's taken to the extreme, then the tendency is we become hypochondriacs. And a hypochondriac is a person who imagines a sickness which actually can produce sickness. When we imagine it, it can make us sick. But they imagine it and then we hear about it ad nauseum, right? Now another extreme of this hyper, uh, being a hypochondriac is what's called the Munchausen syndrome. And, and there's two facets of that. One is where we, we produce, we fake or we produce illnesses in ourselves so we have to go to, uh, to the hospital so we can be taken care of. That's the only way this person feels important. The other facet of that is, is where you produce illnesses in others, normally a family member to the point that, they, that you have to take care of them and that's the only way they can feel important is because they're giving care to this person who's sick. And so I read about one man who was so adept at, at faking these illnesses of, of seizures and vomiting and, and, and all kinds of things that he was hospitalized 400 times and he had 102 GI tests. Man, I wouldn't want to go through that. Uh, even if it made me feel important, I think I'd just soon not feel important <laughs> if I had to go through that. 
But you see, you pull that sort of thing often enough, it's sort of like the little boy that cried wolf, right? Pull this enough and people re will react just as they did with Bartimaeus long ago. Look at verse 48 of chapter 10. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. See, everybody gets tired of that. When we identify ourselves by, when we define ourselves by what's wrong, people get tired of that. And, and so many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man, cheer up on your feet, he's calling you. And throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and he came to Jesus. Longfellow translated this part this way. The thronging multitudes increase. Blind Bartimaeus, hold thy peace. But still, above the noisy crowd, the beggar's cry is shrill and loud until they say, he calleth thee. Fear not, arise. He calleth thee. And see it, so then we see the miracle. Look at verse 51. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. You see, for Bartimaeus, illness had become a way of life. But you see, now a change appears. Now begins to be a redefinition of his life. Longfellow continues his poem. Then saith the Christ, as silent stands the crowd, what will thou at my hands? And he replied, oh, give me light. Rabbi, restore the blind man's sight. And Jesus answered, Go in peace, thy faith from blindness gives release. The blind man, blind Bartimaeus, he is now sighted Bartimaeus. The redefinition is complete. I read about a man who lost his sight in one eye when he was a boy. It's back in the 50s and the, and the parents were roofing the house he came outside and sort of looked up to see what was going on and someone threw a shingle off and it hit him right in the eye and the doctors gave him no hope of ever uh, seeing out of that eye again. And so over the years he began to rely just on one eye and he was at peace with the whole thing. 35 years later when a doctor is in the, examining his good eye, he also examines his bad eye and he said, you know, there's a new procedure that I think, now I can't make any guarantees, but I think if you would submit to this procedure, we could restore the sight in that eye. And so he did, and he gained his sight. And, and, and that's a great story that gives us a sense, though, of the, of the charge and the dynamic thing that happened with Bartimaeus. Here's a man who couldn't see, and now he can. There's another occasion in the Gospels where Jesus uh, heals a blind man, and, and they ask him what he sees, and he say, I see uh, a man that looks like trees. Uh, and so this person knew what a man looked like, knew what trees looked like. So it was assumed that he could see before and became blind. And a lot of people think that that blind man was Bartimaeus. And we don't really know if Bartimaeus could see before or not. But either way, he's blind now and he wants to see again. He wants to see. And so it would be nice if sight could be restored to everybody whose eyes no longer function as they should. And we know that's not always possible. But you know, there are no, ones, no people so blind as those who will not see. 
that will not see what God has to offer. And so the fact is the eyes of the soul can be repaired. When we refuse to see and we're defined by that definition that we don't know anything about God or we don't know anything about salvation, we can have a redefinition of who we are if we just begin to allow ourselves to see. Longfellow ends his poem this way. Ye that have eyes yet cannot see in darkness and in misery, Recall those mighty voices three. Jesus, have mercy on me. Fear not and go in peace. Thy faith from blindness gives release. Friends, have you been blind to the gospel? Have you been blind to, to the faith that, that brings us to God? Have you been blind to the salvation that's available in Jesus Christ? You see, Bartimaeus was moved from sitting by the side of the road as a deficit and walking down the road with Jesus. And that's where we need to be. There's something in this story that, that sort of gets into, me, into my life and, and probably into all of our lives, into our, our weaknesses, our, our doubts, our fears, our preoccupations, our hesitations, all those things that began to define us by what's wrong with us. How do you see yourself? How are you defining your life? How do you define yourself to others? You say, well, I'm an addict. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a failure as a father. I'm a failure in business. I've done this wrong. I've done so many things wrong, nobody could forgive me. Have you defined yourself that way? And what about us as a church? How do we define ourselves? We have a congregation of reserved commitment, a congregation of people who, who want to do good but are sort of hesitant. We're right on the verge of doing something good, but we haven't done it yet. How, how do we define ourselves? However we define ourselves as a church, however we define ourselves as an individual, it need not remain that way for us. Look at verse 52 again. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. You see, whatever we, however we defend ourselves, it can be otherwise if faith, if we could just see through the eye of faith, it can be otherwise. And I'm telling you, to be afraid by what's, or to be defined by what's wrong is unworthy of God's children. It's unworthy. It's tragically unnecessary. So what makes that vision return? What redefines who we are? It's our faith. It's our faith. Our faith in God can do it. All that poorly defines us can be removed if we'll just remember who we are, to whom we belong. And we can go from sitting by the side of the road as a deficit to walking forward down that road hand in hand with Jesus our Savior and it's audacious faith that will make it happen to whom do you belong how do you express your faith how do you exercise your faith do you express it as a deficit or do you express it as a positive and say, I am a child of the King. I'm an heir and co-heir with Jesus Christ. Things are just lovely and great because I belong to God. To whom do you belong today? Will you open your eyes to seeing what God has for you? 
If you need him today, I hope you'll come while we stand and sing today, together. closing song and we'll dismiss our service with a prayer. <clears throat> I am thine, O Lord, I have heard thy voice and it told thy love to me. But I long to rise in the arms of faith and be closer drawn to thee. Draw me nearer Nearer, blessed Lord, to the cross where Thou hast died. Draw me nearer, 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 blessed Lord, to Thy precious bleeding side. Consecrate me now to Thy service, of grace divine let my soul look up with a steadfast hope and my will be lost in thine draw me nearer near blessed lord to the cross where thou hast died draw me nearer 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 blessed lord to thy precious bleeding side almighty father we give you thanks for the power of jesus we give you thanks for the gospel which is the your power unto salvation and father we pray that you would let that power work in us. We pray, Father, that you would help us to release the things that are holding us back from serving you fully and giving you all of ourselves and surrendering all to you. Father, continue to work in our lives. Let us have a positive disposition. Let us always see the good, that though we may fail here from time to time, we can still glory in the cross of your son Jesus. 